Okay, we're rolling. Hello. Hello, Duncan. Hello, Mom. So we are um, we are in a bit of a different place than we were the last time you were on the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. Yes, we are. You want to talk about what's different now? What's different is when you were here in September, I was dying, but it was more of a hypothetical construct to me than what it is now because what it is now is that I am in bed, and I have oxygen, and I can feel tumors in my liver and pinging bone pain all over my body. So a lot of the physicality of dying is with me now that was not with me in September when we had our first podcast together. So the the reality of it is it, it's now a real thing. Now it's not last time it, it 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 was something that at least for me it felt like it was easy to uh, to uh, trick yourself into thinking that it w- w- not you but it was for me it was like well this seems avoidable yeah I don't think it felt avoidable to me then but I've just moved into a different stage of dying sort of actively dying now. Even though that sounds like a, an oxymoron, it does. Can you can you talk about that? What what that means? Well, it's really interesting. There's there are a bunch of things that are happening that make it like that. One of them is that actively dying means that I can actively perceive my physicality changing. So I can I can feel um, that the physical is disintegrated has disintegrated and is disintegrating minute by minute and it's in a particular way that doesn't have anything to do with my planning how it's going to go that's one thing that's happening but also the as the physicality goes through its uh, sort of innate intelligence about what to do under these circumstances there is a, a shining brightness in me that is becoming more illuminated or really maybe just more exposed as the physical becomes weaker and more diminished what I'm noticing as a brightness inside that shines brighter and those are two things that are happening and they're in conjunction I'm putting them together because they're in conjunction with each other the physicality seems to be related to the revealing of the lightness of the human being is the is that lightness that you're talking about is that do you think that that's your true identity or your soul or how would you term that what is that lightness well it feels true so, in a sense, it has a sense of me in it, because it's still associated with me in this body. And yet, it doesn't, to say that it's mine would be wrong. It doesn't belong to me. It just happens to be showing up more clearly, because I'm less focused on my various attachments to all the physical stuff. Which has been uh, one of the stunning things that I never considered when I came here was all the various filing and uh, all the amazing amount of work that goes into organizing your life before you die. It shocked and horrified me, to be honest with you. When I got home from the island, got back to North Carolina from the island, um, and immediately was immersed in banking things and legal things and uh, Center for End-of-Life Transition things and hospice, that I was dismayed because I had spent my life more and more as a, in a monastic environment where meditation and uh, solitude and silence and stillness filled my day, and now suddenly... At the end of my life, all the things it seemed, all the things that I had moved away from were forced back into my attention. 
And I feared that it would be like that for the rest of my life. And I thought, this is not, surely this is not possible. That I'm going to be thrust back into the world here when I am wanting to uh, lie still and be with what's happening. But, yeah, that you still have to, it's like, in the way that you're talking about your physical body is beginning to shut down, you had to actively shut down the, the your world. You had to start dismantling every piece of your world. Really simple, mundane things, credit cards, mm-hmm. bank stuff, stuff that for a person who is about to cease to exist as a body seems pretty irrelevant, but... That was, it kind of is an example of what you are, who you are as a person. Because a lot of people, I think, would just be like, screw this. I'm just going to die. I don't care about organizing right now. It was (laughs) kind of a heroic thing that you did. Well, I don't, I don't want to leave it to you and your brother to have to do. I think that's unfair. So I want to get it done. And how in the world are you supposed to know that I have some Macy's card that needs to be closed or a Belk's card that needs to be closed. I mean, these are obscure things that you wouldn't know. So these are calls that I have to make. And then I have to call Medicare and and say, can I throw all of these papers away? Or how long do I have to save them after I'm dead? And I have drawers and drawers full of these Medicare papers. And the woman said, you don't need to save them at all. We have copies. Wow. So yeah, this is, this is kind of the, to me, one of the i would say of all the aspects of you dying it is the one that is the most shocking to me is just that the revelation of how little in this culture there is we're set up for death it's something that no one tells you about this no one teaches you how to go through this it's just a thing that you're sort of supposed to instinctually figure out and instead of there being a place set up where this you don't have to go through this, it's just this kind of it reminded me a lot of when um uh in the midst of like when I had to have my surgery and when I got sick, it reminded me a lot of the suddenly realizing that I didn't just have to worry about getting radiation. I had to worry about filling out countless forms to make sure that my insurance would cover it. And it's the material world is rude. It is not only rude but it pushes in at us in an amazing way so that and it pushes in at itself i remember there was something that uh your brother and i were trying to close and it it had oh it had some kind of 24 month oh i know it was direct tv and it had a 20 month 24 month uh service program and we wanted to close it down and the woman said well you know you're going to be fined $20 $20 a month or something like that for oh, yes. this being closed down. And we got hung up the phone and I said, wait just a minute. Am I going to be fined after I'm dead? <laughs> $20 a month for shutting down my direct TV. Thanks direct TV. Awesome company. So uh, we called back and direct TV said, in fact, no, but you're going to have to have a uh, power of attorney. You're going to have to have a death certificate. You're going to have to have a uh, proof that you're the executor. And then you're going to have to send us all of those papers. And then we will talk about releasing you from this contract. So this is the, this is where we are now. This is the physical world. This is where we've gotten to as a society is that in the, in this moment, there is this hilarious, it, it, it reminds me of uh, the story in the new Testament where they were trying to trick Jesus into saying, don't pay taxes. And they, uh, somebody came to him and said, you know, what about, what about, what about, are, basically asked him, do, aren't you supposed to pay taxes? Do you have to pay taxes to Caesar? And he said, show me what's on the, on the coin. And they showed him the coin. And of course, Caesar's face is on the coin. And, and Jesus says, give what is Caesar's to Caesar. An indication of like, this is nothing. This is stupid, pointless matter. Yet it's still something you have to engage in if you exist in the world. The thing that you do have to, and I know a lot of people die and they haven't been able to do this for their children and it's a mess. 
but my intention is to be able to get this done to as great an extent as possible so that you all don't have to deal with it. Thank you. I know that you've been doing that and it's been a heroic year. See that people don't understand that um, as your body begins to shut down the levels of there, there's a new kind of heroism that starts happening, which is that when your body isn't processing oxygen anymore, making a telephone call is not just making a phone is not what it usually is because you're, you, you're having problems breathing. So it's sort of like imagine having to take care of all your bills while being at the top of some gigantic deoxygenated mountain in the middle of a snowstorm. That's what it's like. So you have to have a very strong will to go through through that. But we've pushed through it, it seems like. And now you're in a more peaceful place. You've been able you're laying in bed. You we've taken we've t- wrapped everything up and now you seem to be at least, you just you guys were not filming this, but she just rolled her eyes. So I'm assuming there's, well, you would never be finished, mom. If you, there's the upstairs, there's the attic in the attic, Duncan, we have a Marshall Fields catalog from 1810. <laughs> you haven't even seen it. We have boxes full of postcards from the 1800s. Yeah. We have dresses from aunt God knows who from the 1700s. Right. You have not even seen the attic. I've seen the attic. Well, I know, but you haven't looked in those boxes. Well, no, I have not gone through the boxes yet. But I, my order of priorities is different than your order of priorities. I, my but that's or- an obligation to my ancestors. Right. I have an obligation to my sons and one to my ancestors. Your ancestors. Yes. You feel obligated to the ancestors. I feel obligated, if not to all the ancestors, to my mother. Yes. Do you think that you are... Do, do you have an Im- impression? A lot of people say that when they're dying, they, they begin to feel the presence of people who've already died. Do you, do you feel her presence or have you begin to have any kind of mystical experiences or a sense of what's waiting for you? I don't have it filled in at all. I sense my mother's presence, but I also sense these ancestors presence and when I started writing my obituary yesterday which was on my list I realized that I wanted to say that my roots were entwined with not only the oak tree that is going to prohibit me from having any kind of entrance into that soil but also the roots of the ancestors that had lived there since the 1700s from both sides of my family almost everybody has lived in that place and has been buried in that place. And I feel their welcoming. I feel their uh, gratitude for the various ancestry things that I've done for them over the years and for saving their clothes and for finding them interesting and for finding their lives interesting. So I have that, which is pretty worldly. And I am not one to um, have icons or images come to me. I'm not a person who sees entities um, and angelic beings, and uh, and that may change, but that hasn't historically helped me. It's been more of a distraction. So, in terms of seeing beings, yes, I haven't, but I I feel I feel um, held first of all held, but more than hell, there is something that I can feel that is gravitationally pulling me out of my body and into something vast. That I have. There are no entities involved in that. You feel, and can you talk a little bit about that feeling of being held? Who's holding you? What is it? What, what are the qualities of being held? What is, it, what is it like? When I think of being, is it like a physical embrace? or Can you describe that? I can just describe it, and, but it's a warmth. It has a lot of room to wiggle around in. It has depth. It has depths, darknesses. It has luminosity. Um, it has other colors depending on whatever it is that I'm grappling with because also, you know, in the middle of all of this, not only am I leaving my body and not only am I being 
pulled toward some vast mystery, but I'm also trying to reconcile various facets of my life that don't feel completely reconciled. And when I say held, I mean that those lacks of reconciliation are also held. There's enough room in that holding to hold the anger and to hold the uh, resentment and to hold the, um, oh, the regrets and the the anguish of of feeling that I never put, did particularly the highest and most heroic things that I could have done, that I had the capacity to do, that would have perhaps reached more people. It holds all of that. And it, the holding, is it a, for, does it feel as though it's releasing you of the regret? Does it feel, or is it just that it's allowing all of this to exist at once? It's more that. It's an inclusivity. It includes everything. And it, it explains to me that judgment is an egoic function. And we have been immersed in judgment. We've been taught to judge everything. And that what I'm being taught now is to back off from judging my anger and to back off from judging my regrets, but to let them be part of the manifestation of who I am and not to give myself hell about it in some kind of moralistic, fundamentalist way. So it's as though as you're dying, you're becoming more yourself. I'm becoming bigger. I'm becoming more spread out. I'm finding that who and what I am is vastness itself, and it is also an individual. And it's the coming together of those two that represents holding. It's it's where the two meet. And I'm, I guess I'm just trying to understand if this, when you say holding, what or who is doing the holding? Like I said to you, I don't perceive, I don't make up in my imagination entities. I find entities to be distracting. So I go deeper than making up mental images of things. Mm. Therefore, I, when I go deeper than the mental, I am immediately in direct knowing. And I can directly know holding without having to have a um, picture in my mind of somebody holding me. I, I think that that would distract me from the experience of holding, which is an ultimately marvelous experience of being held. And being held is inseparable from holding. So there's a reciprocity of being held and holding that is a, it's different from I am being held. I'm a little girl. I'm being held by my mama. It's not that, but there is a sense that we are all held and we don't realize it. Why don't we realize it? Because we've done so much with our mental conceptualization that we miss what's right under our noses, what we can directly know through dropping into what our current experience is right now. Mm -hmm. And if you and everybody who listens to this can do that, you will. what you will find is holding. You don't have to be dying to find that. It's a given. And, and that dropping into it means if you happen to, to feel like a, a, a like you're not a great person today, if you feel selfish today, it, it doesn't just include all the, it's, if you drop, a lot of people are going to drop into themselves right now. And, uh, who knows, they just finished watching some disgusting porn on the internet, or they've just gone through a three day binge of playing Xbox, or they've, they're, uh, Maybe they just finished uh, their second pack of cigarettes for the day. They feel dizzy. They don't feel health- very good, you know. And but you're saying that that you shouldn't judge that. 
I'm saying that we need to understand that the human being is composed of layers and layers and layers of identities. And the, some of the more superficial ones are ones that we use to charge and discharge. We've been doing that since we were infants, pooping in our pants. Yeah. And so it's inherent in us. And some people are still at that level. They want to charge and discharge. Right. So that's okay. They can charge and discharge. they are just a lot of other levels, and they don't even know this. A lot of people don't realize there are there are many other levels. I've never heard that model charging and discharging. I, I so so you're saying that the oh, when people smoke or engage in whatever addictive behavior or letting off steam behavior, that's a form of just discharging energy. Yes, it's a very primitive form of being human, charging and discharging. You see it in jellyfish too. Yes. I, I, yeah, I guess so. And the human being actually has the potential to be vastly more than meets the eye. And so if we spend all of our lives charging and discharging, we don't get to know that. There, it's okay. But Nothing you're wrong with that. But yeah, I, I just, I guess I want to go back to this idea of like going into your, I'm just, you go, what you, what you started off saying is that you, you've, you're ex kind of experiencing the totality of yourself. You're experiencing the regrets. You're experiencing this higher, you're experiencing this entire spectrum. And when a person drops down into their beingness and they're honest with themselves and they see that where they're at is not is just at a primitive jellyfish level. I've certainly been there. What do they, what should they do? What what should they do in that moment to experience this sense of being held that you're talking about? Well, maybe it's not realistic for them to say, "Hmm, I'm charging and discharging. Now I want to feel held." Because we don't have any control over this. There's mm. that's one thing that I'm finding is that all of this is happening to me, it's not me mentally trying to will something to happen. But what I can do and say is say, ah, look, you are doing a bit of charging and discharging right now, aren't you? And sure enough, this very morning, I did some charging and discharging while you guys went to breakfast. You know oh, what I did? Oh, boy, no. Well, this is St. Patrick's Day. So I looked up Duchess Kate to see what she did on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Nothing but charge and discharge. <laughs> Total charge, total discharge. She got her oh. foot caught in a grate. <laughs> she did. She got her foot caught in a grate. Was she? How does that immediately make the news? They, they. Well, that's a different story entirely. But this is a fractal. What you're talking about here is that that, and and this is something that, um, is. It, I think when you say th these are things that are outside of our control, it does seem that one thing that is within our control is where you want to place your attention. Yes. And so there is this happening right now in, in the fractal of your life is that on one level, you're dying. Your body's dying. You're about to cease to exist as a human being. You're about to go down that path that every single human being since the beginning of time has gone down and there is an opportunity in, in that level for the most intense and amazing uh, melodrama as Ramdas says, if you want to plug into certain parts of that. And a lot of people, that's how they react to this extinction. A lot of people, they don't gracefully pass on, but also simultaneously within this fractal that's happening you have just the absurdity of looking at Duchess Kate getting her foot stuck in a grate. That's still happening. That's going on no matter what. That level of the world is happening too. And then there's this deeper level that you're talking about, which is this being held, a luminosity. And then what you said earlier, which is this sense of being pulled into something vast. And all of these things are happening at once. They are all happening at once. They're happening to everybody at once. There, everybody is, this is nothing new. It's just that I'm closer to, I know that I'm closer to death than you think you are, but you might be closer to death than, death than I am. They are happening in everybody. The potential is there all the time to recognize all of this. Yes. But when we get caught 
in the world, in the world culture, and we perceive ourselves to be that identity, it is impossible. That sets up a barrier to perceiving anything deeper that is right here shining in our hearts or in our faces. What would the world look like if by some miracle everyone simultaneously managed to get to the place that you're at right now without having to lose their physical body? What kind of world would we be in? It would be bright. And truly, I think that's an excellent question because I can tell you this, and this is not going to be a popular thing to hear. The vastness that I'm being pulled into, more specifically, is that my individuality, my sense of individual identity, is dissolving into the vastness where there are no boundaries. The individual identity that I have, therefore, wasn't all that real. Right. And so that's the thing that we can realize is the vastness is all there really is with all of its mysterious appearances and disappearances and dynamisms and uh, effulgences, effulging out of the absolute. So here's a, here's a really interesting thing. I had an idea this morning when I woke up early. I, first of all, I wanted to see if my capacities to do my early morning studying were still with me. And they weren't until I put my oxygen on. But when I got my oxygen on, there they were, and I was able to hear things come, tr- come through me, which is what I love so much. And I had brought a big, thick book with me to bed because what I wanted before I died, this is what I was saying, what I wanted before I died was to experience the absolute. Yes. The absolute dimension of reality, which is deeper than the non-conceptual, deeper than pure presence, deeper than pure awareness, deeper than the divine love, certainly deeper than the ego, the depths of the depths. So I said to myself, I want to experience this before I die. Mm -hmm. So I opened the book and I intended to follow guidelines. One, two, three, four, five. And I thought that by the time you guys woke up, I would probably have gotten to the absolute. Wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) But what happened instead was far more interesting because what happened instead was a revelation to me that I'm already there. Uh. I don't need to work on this so hard. I'm already there. Right. Nothing to do. It happened without my orchestrating one damn thing. That's got to be, that's a, that's a, for some people, that's a little frustrating to hear because it's so counter to everything in our culture, which is that work hard, work hard, do the pull ups, do the sit ups, do the painful meditations, do the psychedelics, do the ayahuasca, all these things to do to get to this state. And to hear you say that this is, there's nothing to that you can do. Well, Let me quickly say that when I talk about getting up at five o'clock in the morning and doing my work from five o'clock until whatever time in the day that I can continue doing it, depending on what's been going on in my days, maybe five to 12, I don't know. Generally, it stops around noon, but I've done this every day for years and years and years, and the various things that are important You start, you start where you are. So I have to say I started, if I started with charge and discharge, which is not where I started. Let's, that's just one of the most primitive. So I just pulled that one out. You start where you are, you know, try to get to the absolute. You don't try to even think about what the absolute means. You just start charge and discharge. I can feel myself discharging right now. I can feel myself building a charge. And 
you are kind with yourself at that point and you don't judge it and say you lazy so and so you shouldn't be charging and discharging that will stop you cold that's the that's the barrier that will first stop you and there are many 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 barriers I think some people are afraid to stop judging themselves. I think some people are afraid that if they stop judging themselves, that they need that constriction and they need that psychic barrier to shame themselves, to keep themselves from doing whatever the charging and discharging behavior is that they were judging themselves for in the first place. Well, they may. But if you look at that from another angle, you will see that what they're trying to do is maintain their being some infantilized adult. They're trying to be loyal to mama. They want her to come change their diaper. That's what they're looking for. And if that's what they're looking for, that's what they're looking for. That's where they're at. Yep. Loyalty to mama. You'd be amazed. So the judgment keeps, we hear you blasted son of a bitch you stupid failure you goddamn blah 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 yes that my friend is loyalty to mother it's also i there's a an excellent uh i i don't remember what university they just put out a audio track so that you could hear what it's like to have auditory hallucinations as a schizophrenic from studying schizophrenics they had an audio track of what that sounds like to be a schizophrenic and and, and the voices tend to be what's wrong with you look at you you're stupid you're dumb you're stupid it's like they've so that thing that is inside people is actually for them mm -hmm. broken away and become an externalized form of judgment that's a good way of putting it and also that's true for many of us people who are not diagnosed as schizophrenic that that part of us has broken away and become an entity inside of us and outside of us that rules our lives with a very a variety of thumbs for example i know many people who have the golden spoon judgment oh that was a wonderful bowel movement what is that that's judgment it's positive judgment oh aren't you cute I, I love it when you do your eyelashes like that. That's judgment. Oh, I see. So you're, I, I, you lost me at bowel movement. The, you're saying that the mother is, um, if they had a mother that complimented their bowel movements as a kid, it gets into their head and they actually apply some kind of. And so they give themselves positive judgment all the time. Now that's a very popular. Oh, I approach. see what you're saying. You people who are proud of their bowel movements. And their cute hair and their eyelashes. Right. And their precious dress. Right. Everything. Form of who judgment. Who is that? I have yet to, I don't think I've, I just, I think we were talking about somebody earlier this morning named, who has the initials KK. <laughs> Mom, you can't, you jet, you're throwing a jab at the Kardashians on your deathbed? <laughs> All is held. <laughs> I just soiled my nest. <laughs> oh man. You know that you know that as a celebrity you have done something wrong if be on, people on their deathbed are are zinging you. <laughs> it's pretty antithetical to what I'm I'm trying to help people awaken to. You know, so maybe she's a good example of what you can see that is the antithesis of of being awake and, and being a complete human being. She's probably not a complete human being. Well, maybe she's charging and discharging. She may, she may well be charging and discharging. And, and, and that's the thing, see, because, you know, here you are saying that we shouldn't apply judgment to ourselves, but now, now you're in the predicament of applying judgment to Kim Kardashian. And I'm not judging you for that. Cause God knows I, there's a delight in judging. I mean, that's a, this is a, um, being friends with comedians. Uh, sometimes we'll get into 
philosophical conversations about enlightenment and uh, the idea of like gaining true happiness or getting to a place of non-judgment. And for a lot of comics, they're like, yeah, that's, that's taking away one of my primary tools of crafting jokes is judging because it's fun. It's fun to judge. It's fun to look at, uh, uh, um, it's like this is something Nietzsche talks about, which is this idea that we need something to overcome. If we existed in a world where there were no Kim Kardashians and if we existed in a world where there were there was there were no no fools or oafs or dolts or people engaged in really basic level activities, then there wouldn't be a pull up bar. There'd be no way for us to to be to differentiate. Well, that's not going to happen because there are all these layers. Right. So you don't even need to worry about that. Right. They're going to exist, but the there are layers, and our job, is, our job, if we want to evolve, if we want to evolve, yes. And I'm not saying that anybody that we've mentioned wants to evolve, oh. like Kim Kardashian, for example. I don't know Kim Kardashian. I avoid looking at her, so yes. I don't even know. But I'm saying that I want to evolve, and I want to evolve to the extent that I can before I die. Mm. So what I learned to do is to delve more deeply into my judgment. And I get curious about it, and I inquire into it. What's this judgment? Who am I taking myself to be? And who am I taking this poor child, Kim Kardashian, to be? Yes. Right. Talk about a lost soul. She seems like a, a good example of a lost soul. A materialist. And I can have, I can have compassion for her easily for somebody like that. So I take my judgment, which comes up anyway, whether I want it to or not. That's right. I am no saint. So I can take my judgment that comes up, and instead of looking out there at Kim Kardashian, I can look at my judgment, the flavor of my judgment. And not only can I look at it, but I can know it directly. I can feel it in my throat. I can feel it in my heart. Mm. I can feel what part of me and what identity is judging. Is it a child judging this person? Is it an adult judging this person? What part of me is even thinking about Kim Kardashian yes. on a Sunday morning? Yes. But I can be curious about that rather than judgmental about it. Right. And that makes all the difference. Right. I see. I see what you're saying. You're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of mindfulness. It's a, not being stuck in the tar pit of the judgment, but just watching it come and then doing a kind of analysis of it. It's to, it's to love truth above all things. Truth not meaning the usual things, but to love what is real. So that if you love what is real, then you will relish the investigation into how come I'm judging Kim Kardashian? Yes. And it's not just Kim Kardashian. I mean, this is a very light version of 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 this. I, I think you know, and a, and a lot of people, the last thing that they want is the truth. The very very last thing that if there was a menu of items to pick from, the truth would be overstocked. I think because the the truth is um, on one level incredibly painful. And, inc and and so painful that it's, uh, I mean, the the state of watching you go through this for me, pers for me is cre is truth. I'm seeing truth, but it's so powerful and so painful on one level that it's it's like put. I I don't know if I'm in shock or what you would call it, but I can definitely see that something else has kicked in neurologically for me where I've, I don't know, I can't describe the feeling very well, but it definitely, I suppose it's the thing that they call grief and the beginning of that. And, and I would say that that's a reaction to this truth. A lot of people, truth is people want to avoid truth. Truth is the, in the same way that you don't want to go jogging, you don't want to work out at the gym times a million because it hurts. You know, I find that uh, I cry so much these days when people send me beautiful uh, love notes and truths. And 
I've learned that it is painful to cry. I don't know why it's physiological pain, physiologically painful to cry, but it is. And I also find that it doesn't last forever and that it cracks me open. It cracks me open again and again and again and again. And my willingness to be cracked open is the truth. And if I were to not be willing to crack open, I would suffer. There would be suffering. So there's a distinction between pain and suffering. The suffering is when we try to not feel what we feel. The pain is something entirely different. There is pain. But suffering generally has to do with attachment. That we're attached to something that we don't want to let go of. Well, it's that um, that state that you're talking about when you're crying. It, this it's it's uh it's not like well first of all a, a adult crying is not a it's not something I I do very much it's not charge and discharge no it's something else when that's happening when that it's some form of spiritual seizure that that happens where there is no control you you. I just have to go through it. And there's definitely, it's painful, but there's a sweetness mm -hmm. behind it. That's unlike anything I've ever experienced. I, I can't imagine being able to live in that state. If that would be possible to live in that state. And I wonder, is that enlightenment is enlightenment? That feeling of sobbing minus the tears. Is it that feeling of, I don't see that enlightenment is a word that's a useful word. Right. I think that it's being real. And I think that what happens when we grieve in the way you're describing is that we move into a different dimension of consciousness and it's called love. Yeah. It's called divine love. And divine doesn't mean woo woo God angels and all the company of heaven. It means the selfless pouring out and re and receiving the the dialectic reciprocity so that you take it in and give it back like an out breath and an in breath and there is in that pain but the suffering comes when we are attached to an idea a mental idea that we have about what should be happening. Right. That's where we get caught. Right. When our plans get interrupted. When we consider that we have plans. Just stop there, you know, that I have plans as I should. Rather than realizing that this is an effulgent universe that has an, a, a thrust and a flow to it. And really, if we would, instead of whomping around trying to plan stuff up, if we would find our way to negotiate into the flow, our worlds would transform. But that transformation for a lot of people is a form of death. Yeah. You betcha. Because what happens in this work is that that which is false dissolves, that which is real begins to shine, called alchemy. And that, that, that's the suffering. The suffering is the resistance to shining. The suffering is holding on to the old ways when everything in the universe changes constantly. You have to look, you can look outside, which I'm doing right now, and I can see that everything changes constantly. The shifting light, the wind blowing through the trees. Everything. And if I am attached to that leaf not blowing, I'm, my, I'm gonna, if I'm really attached to that leaf holding still, then if it moves, I'm going to suffer. So letting go of attachment is one of the big things I'm doing right now. And it's so hard to 
ride the edge between love and attachment. Right. 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 Yes, that's the big confusion, isn't it? That's mm-hmm. such a big confusion. People have confused love with attachment. People think that a relationship, they get into these relationships that are f- solely attachment with no love at all. And they think that the attachment is the, is the, this is the, when you get, in, I, you get in the predicament where you, you want to get in a fight with someone so that they'll say that they need you, you know, instead of just letting them be as they are. You, that's a very common thing that happens where people will try to like, you know, this is the thing where people will uh, withdraw themselves from another person to manipulate the person into saying, I need you. That's charge and discharge. Yes. There's a lot of charge and build charge and discharge that happens in intimate relationships. And I'm putting intimate in quotation marks. Why? Because they're nothing but melodrama. And melodrama has nothing to do with the truth. It's all mental ideas and attachment and suffering and gooey, messy knots of snot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yes, that doesn't last. It is fun for, for a bit, though, right? I mean, charge and discharge is... We can't just wipe charge and discharge off the sheets. <laughs> I <laughs> We can, but it'll come back. <laughs> I mean there is that 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 there is see this is the thing and this is a this this I think is a is an idea that torments people because what what we have here is you know what what you're talking about at the, the state of love non-attached love and then the what the other side that you just portrayed which is this gooey mucusy gamesmanship that is the mating ritual and all the various games that humans play with each other that's based on power dynamics or based on um charge and discharge and attachment so, attachment and so then you have the this sort of sense of the judge judger the judger who watches these things and says oh look at you now you're just engaged in attachment or oh here we are now we're feeling love i've i've heard this in um uh in uh so i i heard this awesome analysis of you know the temptation of buddha you know about this the buddha sitting under the bodhi tree and is there's several temptations that come to siddhartha gautama as he's journeyed to this Uh, out into the forest he's sitting under a tree and he's decided that he's going to gain enlightenment or he's just going to die and so there's these three visions that uh he's met with is uh the is he is tempted by mara the force that the is a term for maya illusion attachment test him and one of these visions is is uh women you know, the marriage or um, uh, the perfect relationship or he's met with this idea that you can, here's your perfect soulmate lover fawning over you. And uh, the analysis of this is that that didn't represent an actual physical. These were the daughters of Mara is what they're called. That doesn't represent a physical form, but rather that's the part of the mind that when you start getting towards what you consider spiritual realization earlier when I said the word enlightenment, that's the part of your mind. That's like, Oh, look, this is it. Now you're feeling real love. Mm -hmm. Now this is real, real love. Oh, you've done it. You're so very spiritual right now. Instead of letting yourself get into the sticky moments too. Here's, here's what I would have to say here. I've just, as you were speaking just now, I came up with, Uh, Some very important things. And what I came up with was a broad reaching sense that our culture and our world in which we live is like a snot ball. Okay. And that we, (laughs) you know, when it's big enough, we want to discharge it. Prior to that, that snot ball builds up charge. Okay. And that 
there is a certain kind of attachment to the snot ball. Yes. And that this is pretty much what describes our relationships. They're snotty relationships yes. for the most part. They're not very real. I mean, mucus isn't what I would personally call a high form of reality. You need it. You need it when you're sick. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. I understand what you're saying. And, you know, in a certain sense, the word pearl has been used. The pearl beyond price, which is to describe Christ consciousness or to describe what the complete human can be once it is developed and um, transformed in the in the human life. And the pearl, if you look at it, the pearl could look if you if you looked at a snot ball and you looked at the pearl, you would have to look sometimes a little bit hard to see the one and distinguish the one from the other. But one is totally different from the other. That's what the ego does. The, tr the ego tries in its very finest valiant way to form what is real within itself. And so the snot ball human is the ego equivalent of the pearl, the Christ consciousness. Gotcha. I see what you're saying. But it's still, it's it, it's it's a pathetic syn synthetic manifestation. But we don't know it, right? It cannot be pathetic if we don't know it exists, right? And we don't, and that's why we can have compassion for people like KK or ourselves, or perhaps ourselves, as we see that we are ignorant about. The snot ball false self that we work so hard to make look like a shining pearl. Yeah, you're tr you're talking about trying to polish a turd. I am. And, and we do that all the time. And my whole culture is making a, a gazillion fortunes on polishing turds. And there are a few of us that are actually working to become the pearl. The real pearl beyond price. And certainly, any time you realize within yourself the pearl beyond price, it is t you realize, good Lord, this totally is beyond price. There is nothing more valuable than this. And let me just say again that I didn't get to this, even to knowing it or to glimpsing it. I didn't get here casually. I, I got here by waking up at 5 o'clock every morning and studying and inquiring and being ruthlessly honest with every manifestation that came up in me so as to find what was true again and again and again. And what I'm finding now at the end of my life is that what is true, as you have said to me, Duncan, what is true can't be bought. What is true is simple. What is true is so basic and so perfectly useful for us to negotiate our ways through our lives. But the, the trappings, the false pearl trappings are in our way. The attachments that go along with the false pearl trappings are in our way. What do we start with? We look at the last time we charged and discharged. You could just do that, you know? What's wrong with that? Okay, so Duncan went to breakfast. I turned on my computer and put in Duchess Kate Blogspot. And there she is getting caught in the grill with her high heel shoe. Yes. That's a charge and a discharge. That's what I can look at. And then I can inquire into it. How come I wanted to do that? Let me tell you, Mom, myself. that's pretty tame compared to what a lot of people looked at in their, their, their laptops. I'm an old morning. woman. <laughs> But it's still all the same thing. It's still all, it, it's still, it's still all, uh, 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 you know, that, you, you know, you, for you engage, whatever the thing is, you know, like, uh, maybe it's video games. There's an example of, a 
a distraction where you really there's just nothing that you get or just surfing the internet just basic internet surfing you'll get done with 30 minutes or 45 minutes or four hours or how depending on your addiction of just boring internet surfing and at the end of it you'll feel empty and kind of groggy and tired and y you'll think to yourself well that you know I, I that was a waste of time mm -hmm. and what you're saying is that though that may be a waste of time you can actually if nothing else use look at it truthfully mm -hmm. and in some way that will push you out of the addiction is that what you're saying i am certainly not saying that oh <laughs> sorry i'm saying truly that everything is grist for the mill but you if you have an agenda to get yourself out or push yourself out of the addiction yes you're in your ego oh see now this is what this is where you're right here mom this thing that you're talking about this is the infuriating aspect of so many different philosophies which is it's saying no you 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 you're in chinese handcuffs if you struggle to get out of them it only makes them tighter true so what do we do you you see how willful you are and how the willfulness is a part of that snot ball yes self. and willfulness is i will i need to control things I have to control things. I want to control things. And if I control things, things will be exactly the way I want them to be. And then I will live happily ever after. Ta-da! Which is contradictory to the entire way of the universe. The way the universe works is not that way at all. It's the exact, exact opposite. The universe is a flow, a mysterious flow. It has a directionality to it. It arises from nothing. It appears and it disappears. We are a part of it. Everything is a part of it. It has an intelligence. It optimizes. It has a, a quality of optimization to it. And when we perceive it enough to align with it, we get out of our willfulness and get into a phenomenon called surrender. Mm. And the surrender is to the surrender of into the intelligence of the universe. If you haven't noticed, the intel the universe seems fairly intelligent. Yes. What you are doing with your willfulness and with your saying, I have an agenda to get out of my addictions, da da. You are blocking the flow of the universe through yourself, through your own consciousness. Mm. Is this is an, is letting go also based on what you're saying another form of trying to control this thing? It's like you can't hold on and you can't let go. You can't act. Any action that you do or that you take, isn't it all willfulness? All willful, willfulness. And if you let go... And you say, okie dokie, now I'm going to let go of this addiction. That's what I need to do right now. Here's step one, two, and three. Mm -mm. Nope. You, the only way we can let go, the only way we can surrender is to say, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was trying to find a better word. <laughs> you say, nothing to do. Except see my willfulness. <sighs> That's it. I can see it. And not only can I see it, but I can go deeply, deeply, deeply into understanding how willfulness became a humongous part of my life. Because I can go back into my childhood and see how there was nothing solid. There was nothing to trust in my early years. I had to create some kind of internal sense of will in order to feel held. Right. I understand where it came from, but is it in? Is it out of date now? It is. But do I? Know, why is it out of date now? Because I see what happens when I let go. When my consciousness chooses to let go into this optimizing thrust of reality. 
it's one of those things where it sounds so easy, yet simultaneously you're saying that you came to this understanding through years of waking up every morning and having a, what, a very disciplined spiritual practice. A very uh, disciplined practice, but that sounds like something it wasn't. Mine was raucous. My practice in the morning has been raucous. So I'll make myself a big pot of mate, and I'll come get in bed with my mate and my notebooks and my books, and I'll maybe find one sentence in the books that hits me, and it grabs something in me. And I may spend the next seven hours writing about that one thing, trying to investigate and understand and integrate it into me so that it isn't just some prattle that I'm getting from some damn book. Because a belief isn't going to get me anywhere. An idea is not going to get me anywhere. An idealization is not going to get me anywhere. Only thing that's going to get me somewhere is knowing from inside myself, and that will actually do it because knowing from inside myself is not knowing from inside this egoic human being. It is a knowing that is arising from that effulgent, hmm. intelligent flow that flows through you and through me and yes. through the trees and the birds. It flows across the door cell and it sill and out the back door into the field. This is a, this is what, is this what we really are? Yes. If I understand what your question is. If I understand what your question is, this is what we really are. But I'm not sure what you're saying we really are. I'm saying there's this what what the 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 model that you have created here is one where when you, when I hear you say go to the truth inside of me, it makes me think of of a kind of geographic location of truth that exists inside my physical body. But what you're what what it's the way you're saying it, it seems more as though you go even deeper than your body. But you start with your body. You can start with whatever you notice. So, for example, if you notice tightness in your chest, you start there. Right. You don't go try to find a better place to start. Because that's shining at you. Gotcha. Okay, that's great. So there's a starting point. You don't start in some kind of made-up, imaginary, deep part of yourself. You start with the anxiety bubble in your chest that you felt forever. Exactly. That's where it is. That's where it is. And you don't want to go there because that place sucks. Because? It's you, painful. You Because you're suffering, because you're attached to... Right. You're attached to the way you think things should be. Yep. So that's great. So there it is. So suddenly what you're saying is that the X on the treasure map, it, 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 it actually is the, the physical manifestation of pain in your body as a place to start. Yes, if that's what's up. If that's what's shining at you. To get your attention, something will, and I say shine, I don't really mean shine. I'm, it may be bleeding all over the rug, <laughs> so, but it, it's what gets your attention. Of course. It's where you are suffering. No, it's so simple. It's great. It's like if you've been shot, you're not going to come inside and start putting band-aids where the bullet wound isn't. If you've been shot, you're not going to put a cast on your leg as though you're leg's been broken you deal with a bullet wound yes exactly and you're talking about that's so we have these sort of wonderful indications of where the work needs to start and they are wonderful but well they are when you when you create this kind of dynamic they are for a lot of people, they're the worst thing ever. Nobody wants, this is the place like, you know, in the, in the extreme, sometimes you run into people and you just start talking about death around certain people and they'll, they'll change the subject as quickly as they can. They're absolutely terrified of it. I know a few of those. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's something you've had to deal with over this, these many, 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 many years of struggling with this cancer. 
but it, it's so 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 you go to this place you t- the, the tightness in the chest and then what now now i've now i'm i'm sitting here with the tightness in my chest i'm looking at it feeling it what do i do now what is my experience in this moment Well, my mom's dying. So drop beneath those words. That's mental. And what is your experience as a result of those words informing you? Well, on one level, it's a kind of like tired anxiety, a kind of like headachey sick dreadful feeling of thickness it's like it's it's horrible now what could you call it grief yeah for sure it's uh it it seems to be a uh so there's a tightness in your chest that you can now associate with the word grief. Okay. Is that what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So can you let yourself just not try to change that, but be with it? Be with this profound phenomenon called grief? Yes. The chest wall opens up. It's so forceful. Yeah, already when I do that, it makes it's making me cry. It feels like already that's changing it. Mm-hmm. You're right. You know, you're right. It's the resistance to it that hurts. Yes. So as you let yourself feel the depth of the sorrow, the objective sorrow of the physical disappearance of a person you love your mother I can, but I cannot stay in that place I come out of it it's like uh, I can get I can get in there for a second what's the belief I can't stay in there my belief is that if I stayed another second right well, yeah, because then you go into that place of like losing control for sure. Yeah, so my fear is I'm going to lose control. And I want control. I want to feel this grief a little bit. Yes. I want to have a little valve on it so I can turn it off and on. Yes. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. And you can do that. It just makes, it just hurts a hell of a lot more. Yeah, the pressure, pressure hurts. It seems like it could even be physically debilitating. To keep the pressure. Yeah. Yeah, probably you would be. It's a great meditation. I've never done it before. So is there any, what's, is it slight, is it exactly the same? What is your direct experience now in your chest? Well, the moment that I really like let myself go into it, it's, it stops hurting right away Uh and it feels there's something very tranquil and soft. So what's this tranquility and softness? Well, it's that perplexing sense that everything's going to be okay. Could you call it holding? (laughs) Yes. But it seems to exist simultaneously with this other, like, freakish constriction. It does. It is all-inclusive. Reality is all-inclusive. And we don't want to judge reality when it's all-inclusive. Includes everything. So why would you judge one part of it and not another? Well, one part is certainly preferable to the other. Why? 
Well, it's a judgment. I, no, it's why would I, I it's the difference between sitting in a, a an ice cold pool of water or sitting in a really nice hot tub. Well, here's one of the things you got to work with. <sighs> the desire for pleasure and to avoid pain. Yes. I think that's a, a fairly healthy uh that's a pretty healthy desire to, it's an egoic desire well it's also what keeps you from putting your hand in fireplaces is it really <laughs> at this point in your life <laughs> yeah, you're you, right. i don't think so i know you're a little better than that yeah you're right good i like it it's really good so you find and this is an amazing thing to find that in the midst of sorrow in the midst of feeling your chest rip apart if you can stay with it a little bit with compassion without trying to fix it and change it and will it away you begin to glimpse the holding right it's there all the time with such benevolence, such capacity to hold. And it's in you. It's not out there in the sky. It's in you. Right. Right. Yeah. It's in the sky, too. But let's make it personal. Thank you. You're very welcome. For everything. Mm. It's mutual. I thank you. I'm honored. And I didn't will you into the world. I didn't organize you into the person you are. It came from me. What you are is a unique manifestation of being. And I am honored to be in your presence. Likewise. So where will we be performing next? Well, I don't know where we're going to be performing next. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question. I want to know that too. I love you. <sighs> All right. Anything you want to say to everybody out there? I want to say that I will be with you in ways that neither you nor I can comprehend. But I know just from doing a podcast with Duncan before that I'm spread out throughout the world, not by anything I'm doing, but I'm with you. Just pay attention. Listen for me. I'm here. I'm there. Hare Krishna. Thanks, Mom. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this podcast, you can find more episodes at duncantrussell.com. Now, please enjoy a wonderful song by the great Jackson Brown. It's called For a Dancer, and it's from his album Late for the Sky. 
You can buy that on iTunes. Keep a fire burning.